Knitted by Whitney YouTube channel. I am back with another podcast episode after a bit of a break. This is episode 19, and this is my first podcast of 2024. If you join me for Vlogmas over the course of December, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And if you didn't, that's totally okay. And if this is your first time seeing me since my last podcast episode, yes, I got my hair cut. And I am loving it. It looks really great today because I had a shower and I washed my hair this morning. <laughs> but I was able to get it looking really nice for podcasting today. <laughs> so I have a lot to share with you today. I have four finished objects, four whips, one special yarn to share in my stash spotlight, and three book reviews to give you. So strap in, this might be a long podcast episode. I hope you have uh, a whip that you're working on and a nice cozy beverage, whatever you like to have when you're watching knitting podcasts. But let's get into this, shall we? We'll start with what I'm currently wearing, which is my first finished object to share with you. This is my Dartmoor sweater by Kadri, and I'll include some pictures or a video or something here so you can get an idea of how it looks over my body, because right now I'm sitting down, you don't really see the whole thing. Uh, but I took some really great pictures, and I'll probably share those because I really love them. I finished this on Christmas Eve. No. I finished this sweater on Boxing Day, so this one is relatively fresh off the needles and fresh off the blocking boards. And I like it, but I don't love it. And I'll get into why that is. First of all, I think I made a mistake with my yarn choice for this. So back in September, I had finally finished all of my wedding knitting and I was just exhausted from almost two years of deadline projects or important projects that needed to get done. And I just wanted something that was completely relaxing to make. My very first choice, of course, was the Lento, which is probably my favorite pattern that I've ever knitted. And the process of making that is really relaxing, really cathartic and it would be just the ticket for how I was feeling at the time. But the yarn that I had in mind to use, which was this combo here, which is one strand of Fleece Artist Vine in the color Swift Fox, which is a single ply Tweety fingering weight yarn, and a strand of Knitting for Olive Mohair in Rust. Together, I didn't like the gauge that I got using the needle size that you need for the Lento. And that's a US 10, which I'm blanking on the millimeters right now. It might be a six millimeter needle. Um, but anyway, I, I knitted up a swatch for the Lento using this yarn because I wanted to use this yarn because we were getting into fall. And this is just like my ultimate favorite fall color, rusty orange. I love it so much. And I thought maybe I can like get a sweater done sometime in the fall and be able to take pictures with all of the leaves and everything. Oh, lofty goals. <laughs> I did not, clearly, because I only just finished this right after Christmas. So instead of doing the Lento, I actually chose to do the Dartmoor. And I talked more about why I chose the Dartmoor in my last podcast episode. And I loved working on this. When it comes to the process of it, I really enjoyed the process. I thought it was a really great knit. I thought it was really interesting how it's constructed and how you start the sweater and all of that. And of course it's top down. Love that always. <laughs> and I was really enjoying the process of making it, but even though I enjoyed the process, I don't think I enjoyed the product. So there are some issues with this in regards to the shaping and the fit that are not the fault of the pattern. They are probably the fault of my yarn but they're just things that I don't really like about this finished sweater. So first of all, I don't like my folded neckband. And I remember talking in my last podcast episode about how much I wanted a folded collar sweater because they looked so cozy, but they weren't as high up as a turtleneck. And 
when it comes to comfort, I do really like the folded collar. This won't be the last folded collar that I do, but I now know if I'm gonna do a fold folded collar, I need to have a stiffer gauge because I find that this folded collar kind of smooshes, I guess would be the best way to describe it. It doesn't stay flat and it doesn't stay where it's supposed to. Um, I do find that it kind of like bows out over top of where I picked up. So it's just, it's an infinitesimal detail, but it's one that bothers me and it's something that I don't like about this sweater. Most people probably wouldn't be bothered by this. I'm kind of bothered by this. So I really don't like that it kind of makes the folded neckband look kind of not messy, that's not the word, but just unfinished or just a little less polished than it could. And I thought it would flatten out with blocking, but it, it didn't flatten out with blocking. So um, I think if I were to undo this collar and pick it up again and try and knit it again, I would do the trick where once you've reached your halfway point, you do a purl row. So that way when you go to fold it over, it naturally wants to fold at that spot because you've created almost like, it's almost like a book. The pearl row is like the spine of the book and it wants to close like that. Um, so I would probably do that again. Um, I know I did that when I did the folded cuffs and the folded hem on my souffle blouse. Um, so I know that that works as a method, <laughs> but I don't know how much I would want that on a folded collar. I think what I'll do next, um, I do have a project I'm working on as a whip that also has a folded collar that I haven't done the collar yet. Um, so I think what I'm gonna do is maybe try it out on that sweater first without doing the pearl row, just like trying to do a normal folded collar again and see if that stiffer gauge might make the collar sit more flat. And if I still have a problem of the collar kind of like folding over like this, then I'll know that I need, need to do that pearl row to sort of act as the hinge. So that's the first thing that I don't really like about this sweater. The second are these big, gapy, loose cuffs. I really don't like that because I don't like loose cuffs on my sweater that then open up my arms to being hit by cold air. Because, you know, it doesn't get super, super cold that I have to have everything tight to me. But I don't want this big baggy cuff. Like to me, that looks unintentional. Like that looks like there's something wrong with the pattern. Like I forgot to do decreases or like I didn't do um, my ribbing on a small enough needle. I did go down two needle sizes for my cuff, but I do think this is part of the design of the sweater. I think even in the pattern sample, it shows the cuffs being kind of open and looser than a normal cuff would be. It's not a tight cuff at all, but I just really don't like that. And I didn't notice that about the pattern when I first bought the pattern and I started making it but I really notice it now and honestly, it really bugs me because especially this time of year, unless I wear a long sleeve shirt underneath, which I usually do if it's super cold out, I just find that like my arms, especially with my wrists, they get pretty cold and it's just an uncomfortable feeling. I do however love that the sleeves are a nice length that I can wrap them around my hand. I do that all the time. Actually, I always pull my cuffs over my hands, it's just, it's a cozy thing I've always done. I did it with sweatshirts before I became a knitter and I do it now with the sweaters that I knit. Um, I actually made a slight modification. I knit my sleeves one inch shorter because I found pre-blocking that my ribbing was already at a good length and I knew it was gonna grow with blocking. So I'm very glad that I did stop it early because otherwise my cuffs would probably be like down to here and that's far too long. <laughs> They're at a very, very comfortable length for me. I just wish they weren't so open. So that's the other thing that I don't really love about this sweater. And 
The last thing that I don't really like about the sweater is the yarn. Now, okay, that's not true. Um, I don't think the yarn was right for the project. I think it is too thin of a gauge. Um, but I also think that the Knitting for Olive Mohair is not all it's cracked up to be. I don't find it that soft, to be honest. I did talk about this in my last podcast episode, and I said that it wasn't blocked yet, so maybe it would soften up with blocking. It has softened up a little bit, but I don't think this is as soft as a luxury mohair should be. Because to me, the Knitting for Olive mohair is a bit of a luxury mohair. Um, where I live here in Canada, I think it's at my local yarn store, I think it's $17 a ball or like $15 a ball. And I needed, well, I bought six for this sweater. I ended up using, I had three half skeins or partial skeins left. And when I weighed them up, I had used the equivalent of five balls, but I still probably would have had to have bought a sixth one just to be sure that I wasn't gonna run out. Um, so I used just over five balls of the mohair for this. And I used about, two and a half of the um, Fleece Artist Vine, which was my fingering weight yarn. Um, I still have quite a bit of that left over and I'm gonna hang on to it because I could probably do an accessory like a hat or a headband. And I would probably hold the um, Knitting for Olive with it as well, simply because it matches the Swift Fox pretty nicely. And I think they look really good together. I love the color. Like I think the color is fantastic. I'm just, I'm kind of bummed that the Knitting for Olive was not as nice as people said it was. And honestly, I don't find it all that soft. Um, personally, I'd rather use a Drops Kid Silk. I think that's a much nicer mohair and it's a lot cheaper. But that's my opinion. <laughs> so this is my first finished object to share with you today. The next two finished objects that I have to share with you, I don't have with me, so I will put photos on the screen. The first is the D&D &D baby sweater that I was knitting. So you actually haven't seen this yet if you haven't watched my Vlogmas. I did show it off in picture form in Vlogmas and I think in my first episode I showed the yoke when it was partially done. I don't think I had the whole thing finished yet. I might have, but I honestly can't remember. <laughs> But I recently made this sweater. This is a bit of a pattern hack because I did use a baby sweater pattern that was free. It was the Patton's UFO yoke sweater, I think. I ended up hacking the pattern and creating my own color work chart for the yoke of the sweater so that I could do a D&D &D themed color work yoke sweater. And I did this because our friends that are expecting a baby any day now actually. Had a baby shower back in early December and they are big D&D &D fans, so I knew I wanted to make them a D&D &D themed baby sweater. So I used some pretty cool yarn. The purple yarn that I used for the main color is by Knit Picks. It is Swish Worsted, which is a super wash wool yarn. And the color is called Mimic, which if you're a D&D &D fan, you know that's the name of a type of monster. And then for the simply stunning fire colored variegated yarn that I used as my contrast color, that's actually by a local to me yarn company called Nerds with Needles, who as the name might suggest are some nerdy fiber folks who make all kinds of yarns dyed based on pop culture, fantasy books, movies, all kinds of stuff. And this was their Phoenix colorway. And I think the size of the yarn is called the best of the worsted um i think that's what it was called um but it is in the colorway phoenix looks like a flame so i absolutely loved the two yarns together um i kind of didn't follow my original plan for this sweater because when i was planning out the sweater that i wanted to make for our friends i had all kinds of big dreams of doing something like what um, bad wolf girl studios does she's the one that designed my astraea sweater she has all kinds of insanely gorgeous colorful yoke style sweaters that are all fully color work and i thought that i would be able to do that for a baby sweater not thinking oh right you don't have as much space to create an image on a baby sweater as you do on an adult sweater. So my original plan, which was 
kind of all over the place. And I went through many different versions of my plan. Ended up being just the swords and then the paladin symbol, which is the helmet with wings. And the reason that I went with the paladin symbol is because the dad of the baby to be always plays as a paladin or usually plays as a paladin. The mom of the baby to be is a forever DM. So I didn't really have anything specific. I really wanted to try and do the different shapes of dice, but it was so hard to make that work with the amount of space that I had. And I was trying to work within um, my stitch counts that I had taken from that original baby sweater. And I really just couldn't develop a repeating pattern that worked for the larger size die. But it did end up turning out really, really nicely. And I gifted it to the parents and they love it. We also gifted them, as you'll see in this photo here, a little baby onesie that has a D20 on it and it says level one human. Um, I think we also got them a D&D themed baby book. I think it was called the ABCs of D&D. &D. And they were so excited about this like personalized gift and I'm so happy to give it to them. Um, I realized as they were opening it though, I don't know why I didn't realize this before, um, it's a pretty large pattern. <laughs> I did choose the 12 month size, but I think this pattern was a very oversized pattern to begin with. So the 12 month size kind of looks like it would probably fit an 18 month size, but it just means that they'll be able to enjoy this sweater for their baby for a long time to come. And after the baby has worn it, they can either hang on to it as an heirloom piece or pass it on to any other babies that might be born in the family and keep it going. So that was my second finished project. Now my third finished item was kind of a whim. We were visiting my in-laws maybe a week before Christmas and my mother-in-law said that she would really like to have a dicky and she was finding that she was getting cold around her chest and she wanted something that would be just a little bit of extra coziness, something that would also have like a folded neck so that she could have a really cozy cowl situation, but then also cover her chest and her chest would be warm. So I asked her if she would like me to knit her one and she said yes. Now I know her favorite color is yellow and I didn't have any yellow yarn in my stash. So on the way home from that trip, my husband and I stopped at Michael's and I went in and I found some yellow yarn. And the only yellow yarn that I was able to find was a worsted weight yellow yarn, or it might even be a DK. And I ended up choosing a pattern that was a super bulky weight pattern. And I'm blanking on the name of it now, but I will put it up on the screen. <laughs> it was a free pattern from Pearl Soho. So I decided to just do that for her because I knew I wanted to get it done in time to bring it back for Christmas. And we typically do Christmas Eve with my in-laws and we do Christmas Day with my family. So I didn't have a lot of time to play around with this. Now, I did something that I've never done this many of before. I ended up holding the yarn quadruple. I held four strands of yarn together to make this pattern. And I do not recommend <laughs> It's just way too much to keep track of. I was working with an acrylic yarn. Of course, I can't remember the name of it, but I'll include the information on the screen. Um, but it was a super, super soft baby yarn, I think. And it was just luckily not too sticky. It was just nice. It, it flowed really nicely. But like in hindsight, I would never have held that many strands of yarn together. It was not the most fun I've ever had knitting. It did mean the project went by really quickly, but I didn't love the process. But fortunately, the process didn't last very long. <laughs> I think I finished it in about 48 hours, which was nuts. But I think it's because I was so determined to get this done quickly so that I would be able to give it to her in time for the next time we were going down to visit that I just powered through it. So yay, at least the process of working with multiple yarns together didn't last very long. Now my fourth and final finished object I do have with me and they were a Christmas gift for Doyle. I secretly knitted him a pair of slipper socks. I am so proud of these. Sorry, they look awful on the bottom. 
Um, we have three cats and a dog. Our floors are never clean. And he has been wearing these almost daily since I gave them to him for Christmas. So they've already had some heavy wear on the soles, but that's why I have the pads on the bottom. But let me tell you about these socks. So the pattern is called Warm and Cozy Socks by Linden Down, and they are a pair of toe-up socks using super bulky yarn, and they do, is it still called a heel flap and gusset if you start at the bottom? I, ha I have no sock knitting knowledge whatsoever, so I don't know what anything is called. So first you increase this little like wedge section, and then when you go to like turn the heel, you do kind of like a short row technique where you are going to each end and just knitting two together, knitting two together. Um, so that's kind of how that heel worked. I don't know what kind of heel that is. Um, if you do, leave it in the comments below. Um, but yeah, this original pattern was meant to have, I think, a ribbed leg that went about halfway up the calf. I had limited yarn when I was using these and I also knew they were gonna be slipper socks. So I only did about maybe an inch, possibly an inch and a half after those, um, after that heel part. I just put in a marker to mark where that row was and then I just knit up about an inch and then I did an I-cord bind off, an applied I-cord bind off because I wanted them to kind of like have a booty look to them. And I am <laughs> ridiculously proud of these socks. Um, if you have been with me since the beginning, I think it was my third podcast episode. I did a podcast episode about boyfriend knits because my husband was my boyfriend at the time. And I had secretly knitted him a pair of socks for his birthday that year. And the only reason that I made him those socks was because he kept teasing me, when are you gonna make me some socks? When are you gonna make me some socks? Because he knows that I don't like sock knitting. Because I had tried using DPNs and I hate using DPNs. I can never close that gap between the first needle and the last needle. And I have tried Magic Loop and I only tried it like once or twice and I just really didn't care for it. Now I also have some of those little shorty needles. I just have never tried them for knitting socks before. Um, and when I knitted him his pair of socks that I made him, which I'll include a picture of here because I love them. They're so colorful and pretty. Um, I ended up using the Addy Flexi Flips needles, which are, um, it's a set of three needles that are double pointed that in the middle, they have a section of a cord. So you knit in the style of Magic Loop, but your needles can bend and act like DPNs. So to me, it included the easiest parts of each style of knitting, DPNs and Magic Loop and small circumference. So to me, it was the easiest way to learn how to do socks to knit them for the first time. And gotta be honest, I didn't hate the process. It just went on for a long time because sock knitting, the, the strand is so thin and it was, it took a while and I gifted them to him and they didn't fit. I was knitting them in secret, so I wasn't able to like try them on him. So I just let, they were also a toe up, um, size, a toe up style sock as well. And I started my heel too early, so I didn't make the foot long enough. So every time he wears them, the heel slides off his foot and it just kind of like sits under his arch and it's kind of uncomfortable. So I was trying to counteract that by making him a new pair of socks, well, slipper socks, because the reason I wanted to make slipper socks for him for Christmas was because my husband hates regular slippers, but his feet get cold. And he used to tell me that he loved how cozy the hand knit socks were that I made him, even though they didn't fit. So I thought, well, I thought about making these in early November, maybe like mid November. And I thought, okay, what if I did really thick, cozy slipper socks. I could follow a super bulky sock pattern or a slipper pattern and I could get them done relatively quickly. I have some yarn and stash that I can use. Let's do this. And I ended up doing it and they turned out so nicely. However, they still don't fit him. <laughs> I think I need to 
stop making my husband socks in secret and just make them so that he knows about it and then I can try them on his foot as I'm going because clearly I'm struggling with making them fit. So these ones are actually too big. I overcompensated and I made them too long. Even though I had one of my coworkers try them on and my coworker is exactly one size smaller in shoes than my husband. And I thought that when he tried them on, he said that they had an inch of room at the toe. And he said that's good because shoe sizes are exactly one inch difference for men. And I don't think that's true because these ones are too big for my husband. I should have stopped earlier. However, I was knitting in secret. I couldn't try them on him. And I thought I was doing what was right. It's okay, live and learn. I'm not that upset about it. My husband still likes wearing them because he wears them over normal socks. He wears them like you would slippers. So it really doesn't matter that they're a little too big. They're very cozy. And he does really like the the big open section of the top and the I-cord bind off because they kind of give it a booty feel. He really likes that. He also really likes the pads on the bottom because they keep the socks from slipping. I got these pads from Acceler on Etsy. They are 100% suede and they come with the holes pre-punched so that you can sew them onto slippers. Actually, they are sold by somebody who makes them specifically for knitted and crocheted slippers. And when I was on YouTube looking for a tutorial on how to sew these on, her video popped up. <laughs> I didn't realize it till after I watched the video that the name of the YouTube channel was the same name as the store that I bought them from on Etsy, which I thought was really cool. So I ended up following her tutorial. I just used some 100% wool yarn that I had and so far they are great. They're amazing, they're so cute. They are really warm. He does tell me that he really feels the warmth with them and he loves that. So that brings me to talk about the yarn. And when I was telling him about the yarn when he opened them on Christmas morning, I got very emotional. I don't know if I will this time or not because that emotion came out of nowhere when I was talking to him about them on Christmas day. But I held a few strands of yarn together for this. The main strand is 100% wool, bulky weight from Taproot Fiber Farms, which is located here in Nova Scotia. They're about an hour away from me. And they have a style of um, making yarn that it is one fleece, that it is one sheep, one fleece, one wool. And all of their yarns, are typically undyed. They have some that are dyed, but I find the ones that are the nicest are the undyed because they're the colors of the sheep. And the name of the colorway is the name of the sheep. So the strand of yarn, of wool yarn that I used for this is called Ollie, because that was the name of the sheep. And it was this beautiful like oatmeal colored, um, single ply, bulky weight roving yarn. And I wasn't concerned about using a single ply yarn because this is a very, very sturdy wool. I didn't think that I would have a lot of pilling, which is typically why I avoid single ply roving um, because I don't like how pilly it gets almost immediately. But I knew that that yarn was very rustic and I knew that my husband, you know, he doesn't, he has some wool items, but typically he only has merino wool. And I didn't want to make him something that he didn't want to put on his feet. And also our feet are very sensitive. Um, so I wanted to soften it up a bit. So I also held some very, very special yarn with it. I held two strands of the same yarn that I used to knit my wedding cardigan. And I am getting emotional talking about this. Why? <laughs> oh, it just takes me to nowhere. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just, I, I wanted to make them very, very special. And you know, it's a, it was a Christmas gift for him. I was making it in secret, but also I was kind of making up for the fact that like I had made him not so great fitting boyfriend socks. Maybe I could make him well fitting husband slipper socks. Uh, they're still not well fitting, but you know, I just thought the first thing that I would knit him 
as my husband, I I thought it would be it would just be really special to include some of that yarn. I knew I had extra of it. I knew it was brushed alpaca silk, nice and soft, and it just feels so so nice with the taproot fibers wool, and he absolutely loves these, and I get so chuffed anytime I see him wear them. Whenever we go to visit my parents or go to someone's house to hang out for a while, he brings them with him as his like travel slippers too. Um, and yeah, I'm just, I'm very, very proud of these. <laughs> also knitting these has shown me I don't hate knitting socks. So I don't make knitting plans, but in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, is 2024 the year that I do an honest to goodness crack at knitting a pair of socks. Maybe it is. I don't know yet. We'll wait and see what the year brings. <laughs> so those are all my finished objects that I have to share with you. So let's move on to some whips, starting with my Livresque cardigan by Espace Tricot. And this one has quite a bit more to it than it did the last time I showed you. Um, in my last podcast episode, I had put it around my shoulders and it was all bunched up because I had quite a few stitches on my needles, but I hadn't yet split for sleeves. So you couldn't actually see it very well, but you can now. So let me show you my cardigan. Right now it's kind of like a bolero size and shape. And it's still kind of like bunched up right here. This is where the end is. I don't have needles on here right now because I had to take those needles for another project, which I'll get into in a bit. But this is my cardigan and I am really, really happy with it. I love the colors. I think it's going to be so, so fun. I I'm enjoying how the progress is going. It is a slower project, but that's okay. I don't mind, but I'm a little worried that I might run out of yarn. So I finished the first ball of yarn. I want to say one or two rows before the split. So when I started the, when I split for the sleeves, I was able to start the body, which I think I have only about two inches done. Um, that's all with a brand new ball of yarn. And this is all that I have left of that ball of yarn. So I'm a little concerned, not super desperate concerned because my Dartmoor sweater used less than three balls of fingering held with mohair. And this is another fingering held with mohair sweater. And this is ball two of three that I have. However, the gauge is different. That one used a US 9, which I think is a 5.5 millimeter. This one uses a US 7, which is a 4.5 millimeter. So it is a tighter gauge. The yarn is going to get used up quicker, but I'm hopeful that it won't take a full ball to knit both sleeves because the sleeves are already, you know, down to here and I just need to go down to here. Um, I'm hopeful that the sleeves won't take as much yarn. Um, they are tapered sleeves, so I'll be doing decreases and everything. Um, and then I'll use whatever's left to finish the body. So this cur this project is currently on hold because I have two other projects that I'm working on that I'll talk about soon. And those ones have deadlines-ish. Uh, one of them has a deadline. The other one is kind of a deadline. Um, so I needed to put this aside in order to get working on those. I started one of them while working on my Dartmoor sweater and the Dartmoor sweater was just really good to work on over Christmas because I was just knitting the body in the round and I just needed to finish that up. So that's why I finished the Dartmoor but not this one, um, even though I have two other whips now. <laughs> I'm doing my best to keep on top of everything and make sure that my projects get relatively equal attention. I don't want to end up starting a bunch of projects and then just having bags of half finished whips. Um, I was like that in like the late 20 teens and then early 2020, 2021. And then I switched to being a monogamous knitter just so I could like clear out my bags of half finished projects. And 
I'm now into my follow the joy era. I mentioned this in my last podcast episode and I'm mentioning it again now because I always pick a theme for the new year. I don't do resolutions. I don't do goals, nothing like that. I always pick a theme for the new year. And my theme for this year is of course, follow the joy. And my joy is calling me towards working on multiple projects at the same time. So that's what I'm choosing to do. But I am really happy with where this project is. And it's okay that it needs to sort of sit and hang out for a while. I will come back to it because it's so beautiful and colorful. And I think it's going to be really great to have that as just like a fun piece in my wardrobe. So it also goes pretty nicely with this t-shirt, actually. I never tried these on together before. (laughs) Now, my other projects are in small project bags, but they're both being kept in this large Fleece and Harmony tote bag. My mom gave me this tote bag for Christmas, and if you know the yarn company Fleece and Harmony, who are based out of PEI here in the Atlantic provinces, um, my parents' next door neighbor is the mom of the owners of Fleece and Harmony. And my mom found out that they had tote bags. She knew that I used tote bags all the time, so she had her neighbor get one for me for Christmas. So I have a lovely local project bag to show off to you. And um, I love the artwork. I think it's super cute. Let me hold it up closer for you. It's all these frolicking sheep. Now, I don't know if they have any of these left over because my mom told me that when she ordered it, they were already getting pretty low on stock. So um, if I can find the link, I'll include it below. So my whip that is getting the most attention is a test knit. I am currently testing one of the extended sizes of the A La Ren blouse by Savannah of Maiden Knitwear. Now I totally got sucked into this one because I want to make this for a costume piece. I love knitting costumey pieces. Um, I once knitted a chainmail shirt for a cosplay that I wore to our local Comic Con several years ago, and that's exactly what this is going to be. So I am making the Aloran blouse to cosplay as Jacqueline from Ever After. Yes, I could have done Danielle, but Jacqueline is my favorite character from the movie, and I wanted to portray her instead because of her line, I'm only here for the food, which is my favorite line in the whole movie, and I just I just love it. So if you didn't see any of my Vlogmas episodes, I actually purchased an overdress from Holy Clothing in order to copy um, Jacqueline's outfit wearing the Aloran blouse underneath, and... This is what I have so far. Now, this is a bottom up sweater. And I did not know it was a bottom up sweater until I had already signed up for the test knit. So I'm stuck knitting a bottom up sweater. I am hopeful, I've got fingers and toes crossed that this will not burn me. It is not a bottom up raglan, which are the ones that are the worst for me. Um, but it is still a bottom up sweater and I'm nervous because it is so hard to try bottom up sweaters on and get a good idea of fit. So I'm doing my best. Um, I have already had quite a few conversations with the designer about certain elements of the pattern. Um, I'm going to talk about what I can without sharing any of the pattern details. And of course, you know, I'm not going to have a lot to show you yet simply because right now it's just a tube with ribbing at the bottom. (laughs) Um, So the first thing that I talked to the designer about is that when she started the pattern, she has a certain trick that she does with her pearls to tighten them up so she doesn't use a different size needle from the ribbing to stockinette. And I don't knit that way. I always use a smaller needle. So I used a needle that was two sizes smaller. So I'm using... um, US 7 four and a half millimeter needles for the stockinette, which is why they are no longer on my uh, Leave Rask cardigan. I had to steal them from that pattern for this one. So I ended up using US 5s, which are three and a half millimeter needles for the ribbing. I tend to go down two needle sizes for ribbing, and it's a difference of one millimeter, which I think works for me most of the time. 
So let me just hold this upside down for a second. The ribbing is very, very stretchy because I used the German Twisted Cast On. Very Pink Knits has an awesome tutorial. That is my preferred cast on for everything I have ever knitted since I learned that cast on. Because as you can see, it is so stretchy. Without stretching the bottom ribbing, it tapers because this sweater has waist shaping. Now, this is not a beginner friendly pattern and I would argue that it might not even be an intermediate friendly pattern. I would classify this as advanced intermediate or even an experienced project because this is not a hand holding project. This one kind of requires you to do some of the work yourself and figure out um, what you need to do to make it fit you best. This is my first time doing a pattern that has more limited instructions than I'm used to. And it's not impossible, it's just requiring some extra brain power and a lot more faith in the choices that I'm making. I am learning to trust myself, learning to trust my instincts as a knitter, and learning to trust that I have made the right choices for the right fit for myself. So in the pattern, the designer gives you both instructions for increasing and decreasing in the body of the sweater. And you need to use either one or both of those techniques to create the shape that you need for your body. Now, because this is a sweater that is kind of supposed to hit at your natural waist, I'm only doing increases because my natural waist, I'm relatively hourglass figured although I have a bit of extra sand, if you know what I mean. <laughs> um, my, my waist is my smallest part, my natural waist, and I'm doing the, the project from about my natural waist up. My bust is significantly larger than my natural waist, so I just did increases, and I did enough increases to make it about four inches larger because the apex of my bust is roughly four to six inches larger than my natural waist. It depends on how I'm sitting. It depends on what I'm wearing for undergarments. There's a lot of factors that go into play, but I felt that that would be a pretty good baseline for what to do for changing the waist shaping of the garment. She did say that the waist shaping is optional, but if you choose not to do waist shaping for this garment, you would, you would have some negative ease around your bust. And if you are somebody who doesn't have a large bust, then you might not need to do weight shaping. I have a large bust and I wanna make sure that my top is gonna to fit comfortably. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty confident with what I've done for my waist shaping. Um, I've marked my increases along here and it's kind of like this section here is straight this section flares and from about here up I'm back to knitting straight again because right now I'm just getting to the point where I would start the underarms and the length in the pattern is suggested to be a certain length and I'm not comfortable with it being that short I want it longer so I'm aiming to have my top be from underarm to waist maybe about 12 inches um, my souffle tee, which is one of my favorite things that I own, is about 11 inches from the armhole down to the bottom ribbing. But with this one, I want to make it a little bit longer just because this ribbing is quite snug. Well, it stretches a lot, but like it's, it's form fitting. And I know from experience with my knit wearing with my tops, if a top is snug, not necessarily tight, tight, but even just like this, which is a normal t-shirt that I wear. It's not a tight t-shirt to me. Like it's not uncomfortably tight. It's just, it fits to my body. That tends to like pull the bottom hem up. So I wanna give myself a little extra breathing room because my souffle has positive ease. This one is gonna have neutral or negative ease. And I wanna be sure that I'm not gonna be tugging it down the whole time that I'm wearing it. So my plan for this is just to wear it as a costume piece. I don't really see myself wearing this in my regular daily 
wardrobe, which is fine. Like I don't have to wear everything that I make on a regular basis. Some things are specialty pieces that you only wear once in a while. And this is gonna be one of them because I'm making it with a specific costume in mind. This is gonna be a costume piece for me. But I don't want it to be so short that I can't wear it on its own to take final, final finished object photos with it to give to the designer afterwards. The yarn I'm using for this is Hobie Extra Fine Merino, and then I've also used Hobie Kid Silk. Uh, they're both from the Friends collection, and I'm just using the color white, um, and I'm very, very happy with that because I'm making this to look like a linen shirt underneath an overdress. And I just wanted to like shout out Savannah for being an awesome knitwear designer and making her designs size inclusive and actually caring that those designs fit a plus size body properly. Not only did she grade the pattern, she's also making sure we have time to test it, to give her feedback, um, to leave time for adjustments if necessary. And I just, I'm just so happy about that. It makes me really, really happy to see designers doing that. Now my next work in progress kind of looks a little bit like the one you just saw, but it is not at the same stage. I'm working on another white sweater that's using a strand of fingering and a strand of mohair together. <laughs> this is the beginnings of my care sweater by Rebecca Klo of the Crayabea. And I am knitting this pattern as part of a knit along that I am running. Myself, along with Alex of Verand Rose, are hosting Liv's Rainbow Cal over on Instagram. And I'm also doing some specialty videos here on YouTube. So far, I only have the launch video out now, but I am gonna be doing another video soon showing my progress of my sweater and also talking about something to do with the cow, but I won't spoil the surprise. But so far, this is all I have of my care sweater. I don't want to talk about my care sweater in my podcast episode too, too much, simply because I'm trying to save those updates for the Liv's Rainbow Cal videos because I'm going to be donating all of my YouTube ad revenue from those videos to the Histio UK Foundation. Um, so if you don't know, uh, we're doing this cal in honor of the memory of Liv Spencer of the Woolshed who passed away earlier this year. And throughout the cal, we are both making donations to the Histio UK Foundation and encouraging anyone who wants to participate in the cal to donate as well. It is not at all required, um, but if you want to be entered to win some prizes, um, there are other things you can do. I will link the launch video below so you can check that out if you haven't already. But just wanted to show that this is the beginnings of my care sweater and not much to see just, just yet. <laughs> All right, time for my last whip, and this is gonna be another really quick one. I just wanted to show my progress on my simple ribbed hat, simple ribbed beanie. It is the one by one ribbed beanie from Pearl Soho that everyone knits and everyone raves about. <laughs> so I'll include the name on the screen. But when I showed this in my last podcast episode, I only had about a centimeter done of it. I have quite a bit more now, and I just wanted to show off the color so you can see how beautiful it is. Um, obviously, it's gonna stretch out quite a bit. Um, it's just on needles without stoppers right now, so I don't wanna stretch it too, too far. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm just knitting this until I run out of yarn, and I still have quite a bit of yarn left, so we got a ways to go on this. But this is my sort of car knitting or, um, anxiety crowd knitting project, but I actually haven't been to many places where I would knit on this. And so far, um, my projects that I have been working on, on the drives home in traffic have been my um, Dartmoor, which is done, because I was just knitting it in the round and I didn't have to pay attention to much. And now my Aloran blouse, which is also in the round, not having to pay attention to anything. So this project has not gotten a lot of love, but that's okay because this is meant to be a long-term whip that I will just update you on as I work on it. So I might not have many updates on it in the next podcast episode or two, especially if I aim to do my podcast monthly because I am focusing on those other two projects and both of them 
are going to be able to be card knitting projects. If you are still with me, thank you so, so much. Those were a lot of whips and projects to get through. Uh, but now we're on to the stash spotlight segment of my podcast. And I have a very special one to share with you today. This is a yarn that I have had in my stash for quite a long time. It is this simply gorgeous navy yarn with silver sparkles. And this is a yarn from a local to me yarn dyer. They are Ravenswood Fiber Co. And at the time that I bought this, they were located in Nova Scotia. They are currently located in New Brunswick, but they are in the process of moving back to Nova Scotia. But this is their card. Let's see if it'll focus. There we go. I think that focused. And this is their 7525 Merino Nylon with a strand of, I'm pretty sure it's Lurex. And the color is Squid. So here's the card info. But this is a very special to me yarn. I have had this for at least five, if not six years. I bought it when they still didn't even have their own website. You had to shop all of their stuff on Etsy. And I just fell in love with this sparkly navy. To me, that just looks just like the night sky. And it's just, it's so precious to me, but it's also one of those yarns that I really, really want to make something with it, but I don't know what because I have that decision paralysis of not wanting to quote, waste it on the wrong project. I also only have one skein that is 400 meters, which I think is 437 yards, if I remember correctly from <laughs> buying yarn all the time. <laughs> Who does that? Not me. <laughs> um, but it is a fingering weight, but it is a thicker fingering weight, probably closer to a sport. And I want to make a top with this. Um, maybe that is a far-fetched idea. I know there are tops like the Ripple Bralette and the um, Ripple Camisole or the My Secret Crop. Like there's a lot of Jessie made patterns that can get away with such a small amount of yarn. I know there's also the mini mock neck tank by Park Knits, um, which Laura Penrose made recently. And I think she only used one skein, but Laura is significantly smaller than me. Um, so I don't think I could get the same out of that. Um, but I was thinking maybe I could try and do a tank top out of it. I am nervous though that it, it wouldn't work out. I could also do um, some form of a scarf or a shawl. The only thing is I'm not really a shawl wearer. Um, one of my friends also gifted me another skein of this same type of yarn in a different color. She got it for me for Christmas the year that she was living away and she ordered it from them and had it sent to me, which was really, really special. Um, and I could use the two together and get double the yardage, but I really want this to shine by itself. It's just, it's so beautiful. So I don't really have any set project plans for this. So if you know of a tank top or other form of clothing option that I could use 437 yards of a fingering or sport weight yarn that will fit a 50 to 51 inch bust, put it down in the comments, please. I would appreciate it. Um, and if you have suggestions for an accessory, like a, a neck accessory, like a scarf or a shawl that is super duper wearable, that is something that you would wrap around your neck. I really don't like triangle shawls because I don't know how to wear them and they never like loop around my neck enough. Please do not mention the Sophie scarf or the Sophie shawl by Petite Knit. I don't knit her patterns, so... Anything other than that one, please. <laughs> so that is my stash spotlight for this episode. Okay, just a couple book reviews to get through and then we're done. I really appreciate you sticking around with me. I know this has been a long episode. 
My first book review of the episode is The Murder of Mr. Wickham. I read this one in early December and I loved it. If you are at all a Jane Austen fan, I recommend this book. It features a lot of our favorite characters all coming together for a house party hosted by Emma and Mr. Knightley. So this book features some new characters as the protagonists. They feature Julia Tilney, who is the daughter of Henry and Catherine from Northanger Abbey, and Jonathan Darcy, the son of Fitzwilliam and Elizabeth Darcy from Pride and Prejudice. So the story is there is a house party being hosted by the Knightleys, and everyone, someone from each and every book is invited. And while they are there, Wickham shows up and then ends up murdered. And it is down to Julia Tilney and Jonathan Darcy to figure out who the murderer is because neither of them has a motive or an opportunity because both of them were not in the room where he was murdered. They were both, they had both have alibis and they figure out that they can trust each other and work together. So it is actually a delightful murder mystery um, and it is really interesting to see um, how the different characters are portrayed. I will say the author's preference for certain characters over others is pretty obvious. Like there's there's a certain set of characters in here that you can tell the author doesn't actually like very much based on how she has described them in this book. But Overall, it's really, really good. I had a great time reading this. It was just a fun, light read. If you like any sort of cozy British mystery, you're going to enjoy this book. And bonus, if you're an Austin fan, you get to read about some of your favorite characters all over again. Now my next book, I did not enjoy at all. And I'm kind of surprised that I didn't. Because it is the latest book from Jennifer L. Armentrout. Now I love Jennifer L. Armentrout. I am a huge fan of the Poppy and Castile series. I love Poppy as a character. This book is the third in the Sarah and Nikto storyline, which is a prequel to the Poppy and Castile storyline. And I loved the first and second book. I really, really did not like this book. And it's making me not like JLA books at all. First and foremost, you need trigger warnings for this book. And there are no trigger warnings in this book. There are situations in this book that depict abuse, sexual assault, various other forms of assault, verbal and physical. And JLA has not given a single trigger warning at the beginning of this book. And I'm not okay with that because I don't need, I. I have not experienced anything in my life that I need trigger warnings for, but even I found this book to be uncomfortable. And if anyone has experienced any of those things and they're just looking to have an escapist read, this is not gonna be it. This is gonna be very triggering for them and very upsetting. So I really did not like that, that about this book, first and foremost. Um, the second thing that I didn't like about this book is that this is recycled content. And I was pissed about that. There are exact scenes that are copied almost word for word from another of her books in this series, from the Poppy and Castile part of the series. There's also the exact same trope that you find in The War of Two Queens. So if you've read The War of Two Queens, you experience the same stupid trope in this book. And I was so mad about that because I'm not reading a new story. I'm reading a recycled story. I don't like that at all. And I'm realizing after reading this and not being happy with it and also reading um, A Soul of Ash and Blood earlier this year and not liking that very much either, is that JLA is a formulaic writer. She writes to a formula. She hits certain plot points as she goes and she uses some of the same scenes and some of the same dialogue and some of the same locations. And honestly, I didn't care for it. And that mixed with not having trigger warnings for some very serious content just made me not like this book at all. So I do not recommend this book. And I'm not even sure that I want to finish the series anymore. 
So when this book came out, JLA announced that this was not going to be the last book in the Sarah and Nikto storyline. Originally, it was supposed to be a trilogy. She is now working on a fourth book in this series. And to me, that is a cash grab because this book was boring. There were so many sections where there was nothing happening or the same type of scene would be repeated over and over again. And it's boring. I want something new. I want something different. I want a story that's going to get a move on, really. And honestly, I was just so disappointed in this. And I don't recommend this book. Done. Now I don't have to look at it ever again. Now I don't normally do book reviews for more than one or two books, but I had to do a third one because I cannot end on that book review in this episode. Fortunately, I read another book since then that I absolutely adored. I don't have the book with me anymore because I lent it to my mom, but I did have a physical copy. It was The Unmaking of June Pharaoh. Now, this was the book that Doyle gave me for Christmas Eve. We do the Icelandic tradition of Yule Book of Lothith, I think. Essentially, it translates to Yule Book Flood because the tradition is that you give each other books and chocolate on Christmas Eve and you spend the evening reading your book and eating chocolate. And who doesn't love that, right? So Doyle gave me the Unmaking of June Pharaoh. I typically give him a list of about four or five books that I'm interested in and I let him pick from that list. And he knocked it out of the park with this one. I love this book so much. After the Sarah and Nick Toast book, I was getting a little worn out on full on fantasy and I wanted something different to read. And The Unmaking of June Pharaoh is a book that is set in the real world but has an element of fantasy to it. So the story is that June Pharaoh is the last of the Pharaoh women, all of whom live in a little town in the Northridge Mountains in North Carolina, and they have all gone mad by the end of their life. At least that's what June thinks. As the book progresses, she learns the women in her family don't go mad they can time travel. And what looks like madness is them living two separate lives in their head. And it was so incredible the way that this book laid that out. And there was a mystery to be solved. There was June needing to understand parts of her that she had never previously opened herself up to. There were family secrets. There was also the time travel. Oh, it was just so cool. And I loved this book from start to finish. It's so beautifully written. I loved all of the characters. They were so well written, so well rounded. They had lots of great character traits. I thought the setting was so nice. And it was just so wonderful and so beautiful. And oh, I definitely need to read more of Adrienne Young's books. I already had a few of her books on my to be read list, but I have now added I think all of her books because I loved this one so much. I highly, highly, highly recommend this book. And I'm now in the process of lending it to everybody that I know because I just, so many people that I know would enjoy this book. And it was just so lovely. It wasn't a very long book and I finished it on New Year's Eve, I think, because it was my last book that I was able to count towards my reading challenge for 2023. But that was my last book that I read of 2023 and I felt that it would be good to include that as my last book review of this podcast episode so that I could finish on something really really positive. <laughs> and with that I am finally able to round off this podcast episode. If you're still with me I am so grateful to you. This was a very long one and I really appreciate you sticking around to the end. If you're new here, thank you so much for joining me. And if you're a returning viewer, thank you so much for coming back. I really appreciate it. While you're here, it would help me out if you would like this video, subscribe to my channel, and hit that bell icon to be notified whenever I release new videos. I hope you enjoyed this very long and rambly podcast, and I will hopefully see you again without so much time passing so that my next podcast episode doesn't have to be so long. <laughs> But whether I see you sooner or later, I hope you all take care and happy knitting!